evening and welcome to A Night at the Movies, a concert by the Hendrix College Wind Ensemble. My name is Dr. Gretchen Renshaw James and I'm so thankful that you're here either with us in Staples Auditorium or with us on the live stream all around the country or perhaps even the world. So tonight we are excited to share with you a wide variety of film music. On the first half we're going to feature music that was written and then later used in movies and on the second half we'll feature music that was written specifically for movies. So along the way we'll be featuring members of the Wind Ensemble who will be sharing details with you about the music and the movies with which they are associated. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about this first piece which was Entry of the Gladiators. It was written in 1897 by the Czech March King Julius Fuchik, and it made its way across the Atlantic in a transcription by Philippe Larendeau for American wind bands. Somewhere along the way, it turned into what's known as a screamer march, so a march that's intended to be played very, very quickly, and it got associated with American circus music. And as a result, it's no surprise that this piece of music was used to accompany a circus scene in the 2003 movie Big Fish. Big Fish tells the story of a man who lived an unbelievable life. At least, that's the way he tells it. So this man, Edward Bloom, he is, when the movie begins, he is facing a terminal battle with cancer, and his family is sitting around him, and he's telling this fantastical story of his life, shall we say. And along the way, he recounts the time he visited a circus and saw the girl he knew he would marry. So in this part of the movie, the circus show was coming to an end as the band struck up the piece you just heard, Entry of the Gladiators. And now, as we move on to our next piece, I'd like to welcome Cassidy Favorite to the front here to tell you more about our next piece, Irish Tune from County Derry. Hi, my name is Cassidy Favorite. I'm a freshman music minor in the flute section. I'll be introducing our next piece, Irish Tune from County Derry by Percy Granger. Percy Granger was a famous pianist and composer in the early 20th century known for his many peculiarities. During his career, he helped revive interest in old British folk songs. He would write out the music for songs that had been around for ages, arranging them newly for wind ensembles. Our next song is one perfect example. Though you may not recognize the name Irish Tune from County Derry, many of you will know this next piece, most likely is the song Danny Boy. We are playing this piece in the context of a film titled Brassed Off, set in a village in northern England. This village has two things very near and dear to its heart, a coal mine and a brass band. <coughs> Both have been around for over a hundred years and are central to many of the villagers. However, the coal mine is being closed down, costing many of the men their jobs. The band has just returned from a national semi-finals competition when they find out about the mine. Shortly after, their director, named Danny, collapses due to complications with a condition called black lung, common with minors, and is rushed to the hospital. The band members gather outside of the hospital and play this song for him, what they believe to be their last time to play together. This film demonstrates the power of music to hold people together and carry them through difficult times. The men in the brass band are from all different walks of life, but can all share in the healing power of music. We are fortunate to have members of the Natural State Brass Band join us today. And we will have the lyrics will be um, on this slideshow, so I encourage you to follow along. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Steven Flores. I am actually a graduate student at the University of Central or uh, of Arkansas, University of Central Arkansas. Um, I am a euphonium performance major, and I am playing tuba with the Hendrix Wind Ensemble right now. The next piece we'll be talking about is the Allegretto, the second uh, the second movement from Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, was actually completed in the spring of 1812 by composer Ludwig van Beethoven. Beethoven, born in 1777 and died in 1827, was born in Bonn and comes from family with a strong musical tradition. He later started losing his hearing throughout his life. This piece was composed in his middle period of his life where he experiments with innovative ideas within his compositions. The piece that the, the movie that the piece comes from um, is Immortal Beloved, 1994, features Gary Oldman as Beethoven himself, and it's a about biographical life of Beethoven and the immortal beloved um, that they found after his death. Letters to his immortal beloved that they found after his death. Anton Schindler, his secretary and first biographer, goes and tries to track down who this mysterious woman is. There is speculation whether Carl or Carl is Beethoven's nephew or the love child of Joanna Rice and Beethoven since she married his brother, Kaspar, one of his younger siblings. They get into a legal battle over custody of Carl, where Beethoven takes any means necessary to defame Joanna, eventually winning the custody. Beethoven, like his father, wanted to raise a child prodigy, prompting Carl to attempt suicide, troubling Beethoven even further. The music starts off uh, so, starts soft and mysterious, eventually building up in intensity and motion until we reach a high point in the music. This ties in with the movie as it depicts a journey Carl goes through after having enough uh, with his uncle and his wish for Carl to become a pro child prodigy. Carl is shown finding a box with guns in it and he takes it up to the balcony where he stands over the ledge and points the gun to his head. At this mo as this moment happens, the second movement has reached its high point, adding to intense the intensity of the scene. He was unsuccessful in his attempt and grazed his head with a bullet, thus he lived much to Beethoven's relief. This piece, um, as you will hear, it, it will grow and expand, and you'll kind of, if you, if you kind of see it as a journey, you know, beginning to end, um, the way it grows, um, hopefully you'll be able to paint the picture in your head.
Good evening. My name is Danielle Rawson. I am a senior music major and an oboist. I will be introducing the Bursus and finale of Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. Igor Stravinsky was a Russian composer and is considered one of the most influential composers of the 20th century. He is particularly well known for his ballets, which were written for a ballet group called the Ballet Russe. The Firebird was the first of these ballets, followed by Petrushka, and then the Rite of Spring, otherwise known as the ballet that started a riot. But that's not for this time. The story of the Firebird is a bit complex, because Stravinsky actually combined two folk tales into one plot. The hero of the story, Prince Ivan, is hunting in a forest and spots the Firebird, a glowing bird who may bring both fortune and doom to its captor. Prince Ivan chases and captures the Firebird, but Ivan decides to spare her life. In exchange, the Firebird gives him a feather, which can be used to summon her if he ever needs her help. Later on, Prince Ivan then meets 13 princesses who are all under the spell of an evil magician. And of course, Ivan falls in love with one of them. So Ivan confronts the magician, who sends his minions after Ivan. He then summons the Firebird, who intervenes and saves his life. And this is where our excerpt of the suite picks up. The Bursus, the first part of the piece that you are about to hear, is a lullaby that the Firebird sings to put all of the evil creatures into a deep sleep. With the Firebird's help, Ivan breaks the magician's spell and destroys the magician and all of his minions. In the finale, the princesses and other beings that were once under his spell awaken, and Ivan and his princess celebrate their victory and presumably live happily ever after. Now you may recognize some of the themes of this piece from the final scene of the Disney film Fantasia 2000. 
In this interpretation, Stravinsky's music is used to depict the melting of winter into spring, which turns into a battle between a spring sprite and a firebird. Unlike the ballet, however, this firebird is a force of evil. It destroys the spring sprite and burns down a large forest area. Ultimately, spring does return, turning ashes back into life. So both interpretations of the piece, particularly the Basusum finale, um, involve magical elements and a battle between forces of good and evil. Although the firebird itself plays a different role in each version, the idea of reawakening or renewal remains in both, and I hope you will hear that in this piece.
Hello, my name is Shepard, Carly Shepard. I'm a sophomore biology major at Hendrix. I play the oboe, and I am very excited to announce that we'll begin the next portion of our concert by playing a James Bond medley. The music from James Bond movies is famous. Moving from the era of jazz to pop, the music personifies the aloof and mysterious character we still love to see. But the best known music lives beyond the movie. All the songs in our next piece made it to the top 10 of the Billboard Hot 100 songs after the release. And several of them have won or been nominated for awards. One of them won a Grammy, a Golden Globe, and the Academy Award. From Shirley Bassey to Paul McCartney, Carly Simon to Adele, artists have become well known for the music they wrote for the films. The opening credit music from Bond films is memorable because of the way it captures the film's tone, characterizing what people have come to expect from the Bond persona. When fast-paced, it mirrors the anticipation the audience feels during an action sequence, and when slow, it shows the suaveness of our favorite spy. Like the best movie music, it draws our attention to what's on the screen, creating the captivating scenes we love watching. I hope you enjoy the music from James Bond. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Ashton Leach. I'm a sophomore at Hendrix, and I am an uh, English film major. Okay. In 2001, director Peter Jackson released the first film in a series that would take the world by storm. Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, brought to life characters from J.R.R. Tolkien's um, novel series by the same name. And overnight, Frodo and Gandalf became household heroes. The film follows young Frodo Baggins and his eight companions as they travel to Mordor to destroy an all-powerful ring that places the fate of Middle-earth in danger. Throughout their journey, they're accompanied by the music score of Howard Shore. Shore guides our emotions through the film and does a superior job of transporting us to a place of fear, tension, joy, and excitement. Shore was born in 1946 in Toronto, and just as soon as he could, he was creating music. In his early career, Shore composed music for television series, most notably uh, NBC's Saturday Night Live. He soon transitioned to scoring movies and um, portrayed eerie and ominous sounds, much like Danny Elfman. Similar, or that's when Lord of the Rings was released. Many people were completely struck at the complex beauty and power Shore created. This work earned Shore a Grammy and an Oscar, as well as numerous other nominations. Without further ado, here's the music from Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Rings by Howard Shore.
Good evening, everyone. My name is John Dale Nichols, and I'm a junior physics and Spanish double major here at Hendricks College. I play tuba in the wind ensemble, and I'll be talking to you about our final piece tonight, Symphonic Suite from Star Wars The Force Awakens by John Williams. <laughs> 
John Williams is one of the most prolific movie soundtrack composers of the 20th and 21st centuries. He has composed some of the most easily recognizable tunes in the history of film and has been dominated for 41 Oscars, five of which he's won. His work has firmly cemented his place in the hearts of, and minds of many as America's composer. In addition to film scores, he wrote the fanfares for the 1984, 1988, and 1996 Summer Olympics, as well as for the 2002 Winter Olympics. Let's talk a little bit about his film scores. Williams has scored the soundtracks for Indiana Jones, E.T., Jaws, Superman, Harry Potter, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, and of course, Star Wars. Star Wars The Force Awakens is the seventh installment of George Lucas' epic science fantasy saga. It follows the story of Rey, a scavenger, and Finn, a stormtrooper who defected from the First Order as they seek to get a BB-8 droid to the Resistance. The droid has information on the whereabouts of the legendary Luke Skywalker, who disappeared after his victory against the Empire 30 years previously. Ray and Finn meet with many fan favorites along the way, both old and new. As is typically the case, the most exciting, the most emotional, the most powerful moments in the film are accompanied by equally powerful music. Although this pattern is very common, Williams is famous for how he carries it out. The reason that John Williams' tunes are so easily recognizable is his use of something called a leitmotif a melodic phrase or figure that is associated with a character, an idea, or a situation. The leitmotif is most, commonly, is, uh, most closely associated with operatic composer Richard Wagner, but John Williams is almost certainly its strongest contemporary user. Perhaps the most easily recognizable leitmotif that we'll be playing for you tonight is the main theme from Star Wars, a bold, triumphant fanfare that accompanies the title crawl of every Star Wars movie. One of my personal favorites that gets more time in this arrangement than any other that I've played is the May the Force Be With You motif, also known as Obi-Wan's theme in the original trilogy. It's a slower tune, but no less powerful. If anything, this leitmotif adds a softer, subtler power to the music, just like Obi-Wan himself. In the original trilogy, Obi-Wan used the Force in some of the least conspicuous ways possible, including the famous Jedi mind trick, which we see used in Episode 7 by Rey. For this reason, it is unsurprising that Obi-Wan's theme is associated with Rey in this new chapter of the story. Williams' genius blend of old and new in his score is a huge part of the, movie, is the, of the movie's success. As we play this piece for you, I ask that you watch the giant screen above us. As we play different parts of the song, the screen will show scenes from the movie, which were accompanied by the music we will be playing. We hope you enjoy this performance of Star Wars, and afterward, we invite you to please join us in the Trishman Gallery for a reception.